Thursday morning, 8.30 a.m., here we are. So homework four, you're turning in right now. Magically, there's a stapler up here uh, if you need it. Homework five is posted. That is due a week from today. I will have office hours next week, probably Wednesday afternoon. I'll tweet about that. Uh, any questions about the situation? Okay, so we past couple of lectures have been learning about chaos and how to quantify it. So we have in one dimension we have uh, a map that we're iterating and we'd like for a chaotic orbit of that map to be bounded. It's not headed off to infinity. It doesn't approach something that repeats. It's not asymptotically periodic. And uh, it's also going to have a positive Lyapunov exponent, which means it experiences stretching nearby more often than not. So those are the ingredients. And uh, you know, the last couple classes, we've been sort of getting a feel for what that Lyapunov exponent calculation looks like. It's a thing that we can do by hand for periodic orbits, often, if the periods are low because we're looking at you know, averaging the logs of the exponents, um, or the logs of the slopes, which are the exponents of the slopes. Um, and those things repeat if we're on a periodic orbit. If it's actually not periodic, uh, if, it's a, if it's an orbit that goes to a sink, then its Lyapunov exponent should be whatever the slope is at the sink, because in the limit, that's where it's approaching. So a point in the basin of a sink should have the same Lyapunov exponent as the sink. These are things you're going to start exploring on this homework. This homework is all, homework five is all about Lyapunov exponents and measuring them. And then there are these orbits that, you know, we care about, the chaotic ones, that we can't analytically write down the expression for it and simplify it somehow. And because the f primes, if x doesn't settle down, then the f primes probably aren't going to settle down for most of our uh, functions we care about. The slope is the same everywhere. If it's two everywhere, then we can do that. But So on your homework, you'll do... Uh, You'll do that bifurcation diagram for the logistic map, which I showed you during the first week of class. You'll make that. And you'll also plot above it the Lyapunov exponent of each of those orbits for every value of a. And um, that's going to be an interesting plot to look at, because it'll be negative for the spots where things settle into a sink. It'll be positive where there's chaos. The exponent will be. Um, OK, so yeah, so we're going to. Um, we're going to talk today about the relationship between the logistic map and the tent map that we learned about last time, the 2x up and 2x down map. Uh, and through this concept of the conjugacy, they're related to each other, these functions, in an interesting way. And then we're going to define this transition graph that I was describing to be a really powerful way to do analysis of dynamical systems. So we got the L, we got the R, and then we're going to draw arrows between them. We're going to learn what the arrows mean today. That's important. And then when you're answering questions like number one on homework four, you'll be able to use things like these transition graphs to answer questions uh, without actually having to iterate maps, because you'll just say stuff about strings of L's and R's. So it's very powerful in that regard. Questions about our plan for the day? OK, cool. So we'll start, with, uh, we'll start today with chapter 3.3 which is about conjugacy and the logistic map. OK, so I'm going to show some figures from your book. You got these in there. If you pull up, uh, you opened up your book. So, so this is figure 3.3. Um, so we have the tent map on the left. That's the 2x, and, um, 2x up and then the 2x down map. And we talked about it last time. It's got slope 2 everywhere in magnitude. So any periodic orbit has to be a source. Can't attract things slowly. There are no AP orbits, unless they're EP, because you can land on a source. There'll be lots of those. Um, in fact, things that land on a half will be boundary points between these regions that um, L and R and LL, LR, all those things. 
But it's related to the logistic map in this way we're going to learn about today. Um, there's going to be a transformation, a one-to-one -one continuous function from this space to that space that relates the dynamics perfectly. Uh, cool. So both of these functions, the temp map and the logistic map, they have a logistic map for, for the parameter value 4. They all have a periodic orbit for every integer period. They're all sources. And uh, there are no sinks. And, and random initial condition is going to not be on one of those. It's going to be an irrational number. And it's going to bounce around forever, being pushed around between all of those sources. And you know, by the end of the class today, we're going to try and have the ability to describe what I just said you know, really well just using L's and R's uh, from this, this transition graph concept, symbolic dynamics. All right. So the, the question that is inspiring this chapter is, you know, we want to show, we'll switch to purple, want to show that G has chaotic orbits. We showed a few classes ago that the 2x mod 1 map had chaotic orbits. Um, so we wanted to show that G has chaotic orbits, and we'll do it by comparing with the tent map T on the left. So, um, so the slope of each of these things, so t prime and g prime, the slope is actually both, it's minus 2 at both of the second fixed point. Um, so, so t has fixed points at x equals 0 and 2 thirds. Um, g has fixed points at x equals 0 and 3 quarters. Remember, T is um, the tent map, and G, 4x, 1 minus x, the logistic map. Uh, all right, I was saying T prime at 2 thirds and G prime at 3 quarters. These are both minus 2. Um, OK, cool. And then they each have period 2 orbits. So there's you know, a period 2 orbit P1, comma P2 that is the square in this picture, 0 0.4, 0 0.8. Uh, so that's 2 fifths and um, 4 fifths. And then you know, some not as nice numbers being the P1 and the P2 for the logistic map. Remember, if we want to analyze the stability of those things, we can either look at, using the chain rule, the slope at both points, which on the left here, the slope is uh, 2, and here it's minus 2. So if I plotted t2, I would see that the slope where t2 crosses y equals x four places, at the two places corresponding to 0.4 and 0.8, the slope would be, would be uh, 4 in magnitude. And then multiplying 2 together. Um, that would be the same thing that I would get. I would get minus 4 if I multiplied the two slopes of g at p1 and p2. g prime at p1 times g prime and p2, 4. Same thing if I looked at the slope of g2 where it crossed y equals x. Um, OK, so g2 prime and t2 prime, um, these are both minus 4 at any of these points, p1, p2. Kind of spooky. So far, it's spooky. And what we're getting at here is that for each point in the domain of T, um, there is a companion point which we're going to call C of X in the domain of G, got to figure out what C is, that imitates its dynamics exactly. 
So, so far we're just looking at the correspondence between, you know, these two initial points, but these two periodic orbits. But they're, you know, every point x is going to have this relationship. So we'll say f and g are conjugate. Um, if they're related, by a continuous one to one change of coordinates. Such that if I take uh, my change of coordinate C and compose it with F, I get the same thing back that I would if I took G and composed it with C. And C is this conjugacy. And we'll write it down for our uh, example here. So here for T and G, uh, C of X is equal to 1 minus the cosine of pi X. Uh, 1 minus the cosine of pi x divided by 2. So what I'm claiming is that if I take C and compose it with the tent map, C of T, that is I plug the tent map into that expression, I would get back the same thing that I would get if I took the logistic map G and composed it with C. So plugging that thing into f the X here and here. Yeah. Man, they're, they're very close to each other, aren't they? Because I've gone capital letters here. So this, this is a G and this is a C, G of C. Yeah, so they're ba they, they flip. So C of T, G of C. Uh, C inverse would do the opposite. C inverse would take as an input G and um, an argument, or uh, uh, T, of, T of C inverse is C of G. And we'll write that down too. Um, okay. So what does this function look like? Let's just draw it. Uh, okay, so we're going from 0 to 1, and if I plug in 0 for x, what's the cosine of 0? I see some 1's. 1 minus 1 is 0, divided by 2 is 0. So it's right here. Nice. Uh, and then what is the cosine of pi? Minus 1, well done. Minus 1, so 1 minus minus 1 is 2, divided by 2 is 1, so it comes up here. Okay, it's 1 to 1 and continuous, and it's a cosine, so it's going to look like some sort of wave. I'm sketching here, something like that. It's a uh, half a period, 0 to 1, of this C function. It's got a plus a half. It's flipped, doing all your things you learn about in calculus for plotting functions. Okay, so yeah, this is pretty neat. So let's confirm at least some of the stuff that I've written down here works for this function for our map. So, um, so I've said that uh, g of c of x is supposed to be c of t of x. Let's, let's write down what these things are. So g of c of x. That should be, I'm going to take my C and I'm plugging it in. So that's 4 times C of X times 1 minus C of X. My C and my parentheses are very, very similar. So we're looking for context here. We'll count the parentheses. Uh, and this is, so 4 C of X, I'm going to just stuff that thing in. This is 4 times 1 minus cosine of pi X divided by 2. 
1 minus 1 minus cosine of pi x divided by 2. And if I do arithmetic on that, I should end up with the same thing that I would get by taking the tent map and plugging it in as the argument of, of C. Hmm? So what am I saying? I'm saying C of T of x. That's going to be 1 minus the cosine of pi. And then the pi, so this cosine is getting as an argument pi, and then t divided by 2. I should get the same thing back for these two. So arithmetic, if I do some stuff here, I'm going to end up with... Uh, Maybe we should just try and do a little arithmetic. So we have, uh, so the, four, the first four can cancel that two, and I'll end up with uh, a two hanging out front. And I still have my one minus cosine of pi x. And then over here, if I take one minus this, that's like I flip those. Um, so I'm going to end up with a positive a half. Is that right? Uh, hanging out by itself. A half, and then... Cosine of, yeah, so I'll have a 1 minus, I have a cosine x over 2 plus a half. Or, does that look right? I think so. Does that look okay? All right. And then the 2 is, I can take the 2 down. There's lots of ways to simplify this. I'm being a little silly now. 1 minus cosine of pi x and 1 plus cosine of pi x. Whenever you see that, that means my cross terms on the inside are going to explode and cancel each other out. Like there'll be a cos pi x minus cos pi x, and they'll go away. So I'll be left with uh, 1. That's the 1 squared. And then I'll get a square of the other thing. 1 minus cosine squared pi x. Which is tree identity. It's early. Think about the circle. Sine squared. Yes. You did it. Sine squared x. Cool. Um, so I can plug in. Uh, the, so this is what I got back. I can plug in the just the two the positive slope part here, which is two x. Yeah. Uh, we keep the pi inside of the sine squared. Yes. Good. Thank you. So I'm gonna I'm gonna just do this bottom one for the two x. It'll work just fine for the negative slope version as well. But if I put a two x in here, this is. Uh, 1 minus cosine of 2 pi x divided by 2. Sticking in what I know about the tent map. And miraculously, this is a half angle, double ang or double angle identity thing. This, this fraction right here is exactly equal to um, sine squared of pi x. So the, one of your double angle identities that at some point you saw in a calculus book. And the same thing would happen if we, if we put in the minus 2 slope segment of this function. OK. So we've done some algebra, but I think that the, the idea, the important idea, we need to talk about a little more about what's happening. Um, so it is the case that analysis of the tent map is simpler than analysis of the logistic map. Why is that? The slope is the same everywhere. So deciding what the stability of an orbit is, is you know, it's easier to do algebraically because you're just multiplying twos together. Um, the action of an orbit, if you've written it in binary, when you send an orbit point through the tent map is much simpler, right? It shifts the point over by one, in uh, the bit over by one. And if it's 
you know, and if it's on the far side, it's going to flip the zeros to ones and ones to zeros, but still much simpler than what happens with the logistic map with the curves. Cool. So um, what we're going to think about doing here is doing some analysis in the space of the tent map about points that are we care about the orbit in, under the logistic map. So here's how that would happen. You're given some point under the logistic map, and you're said, oh, you said, know, I ask you, figure out what's going on here. Is this a chaotic point? Is this a, a point that's a source? Is it eventually periodic to a source? And let's say that calculating g, I'm going to ask you to do it a million times. And you have to do this by hand. OK, exploding, you know, it's not going to work, right? So what am I going to do? Well, what I'll do is I'll take that point, call it x, and I'll invert it, x0. I'll invert it through c. I'll send it through c inverse. And that takes me up here into the tent map domain to a point that has the same dynamics as g, as it, that point x does under g. So call it y0 up here. So it's x0 over here, it's y0 up here. I can then iterate that point under the tent map a billion times. If it's written in binary, I know that just means I need to go over to the billionth bit and throw away the stuff that was to the left of it, because that doesn't matter. And um, actually, if I get a 1 left of it, that means I should flip everything, all the zeros to 1s. But that's the second piece of it. But that's, that's, we can figure out how to do that. That's just some bookkeeping. So I can iterate a billion times and get back an answer of where it went. And then I can send that back through C. C is just this continuous transformation. And I land at the point that I would have gotten had I iterated the logistic map a billion times. OK. I've described what this is, you know, why this is helpful just now for an orbit point, but this is a huge idea in applied mathematics, what I just described. You have a system that's complicated, that's difficult to model, that is expensive. It costs two weeks on a supercomputer to figure out what's going to happen. And what you try and do is find something like a conjugacy that takes you from that expensive model space, where you need an answer, into a cheaper model space where you get back effectively the same thing. But it's a lot easier to analyze. So an example that we've talked about in the past is the, is the weather forecast. So G is what the atmosphere does, and we can't represent it perfectly. It would take you know, all the computing power in the world to make um, a forecast uh, longer than a week. So what we do is we, we take the, our best guess of what the atmospheric state is at the initial point when we want to make a forecast. That's over here. And we send it through a transformation into the space of a model, a model that we understand or that we can run on the computer with less expense. And we don't get exactly the initial value of the Earth. We get some approximate value of it. That's OK. That's called data assimilation. There's a whole field of mathematics about that inverse problem. Take the million observations we get and extrapolate them into 10 billion degrees of freedom for a weather model <coughs> to start a forecast. OK, we run the forecast. That's the thing we can do. We get an answer. This is what happens a few weeks later. And we then need to map that back down into reality. Well, the computers make mistakes, potentially, or our model's simpler than um, the actual atmosphere, so there's errors introduced. There's chaos. The fact that we didn't start exactly at the initial state means that it spreads away from what actually happens. These are all things we have to account for. But then what, it, what we get back is some approximate version in the abstract sense that I'm talking about of what we would have gotten if we were just to take the Earth and perturb it 25 times and watch the next two weeks of of each of those Earths. So I've, I've described an example for, for atmospheric science, but you know, this is what we do in science. We take a system we're trying to understand in the real world, we map it into the mathematical modeling space, which is the one we understand and can analyze, and maybe it's a lot simpler, it's lower dimensional, and then we map it back. And having this conjugacy is really important because it allows you to know, well, what's the relationship between the dynamical system I want to predict and the one that I can write down? They're not going to be the same thing, because there, you know, there are all these approximations we have to make. Um, cool, but in the case of the logistic map, it's per, it, this is like exact. What we're doing is, is there are equal signs on either side of these equations. So we take a point in the logistic map space on the board. I guess it's uh, yn. We can send it back to the tent map space. It's xn. Iterate it once or iterate it a billion times. And whatever we get back, we can send it through the function c, and we land at where the logistic map would have sent that very same point. Um, OK, questions about stuff that I've said here? Yeah? Right, I just wrote it down. <laughs> 
I wrote, the question is where did C come from? Um, I just wrote it down so I, we didn't, I didn't show you where it comes from yet. Um, on your homework, you'll, you'll do a simpler example of this to try and figure out what C looks like yourself. Um, it doesn't always exist. There are certain classes of functions for which this will make sense and will work. Um, so, yeah, so for example, if I took the parameter 4 and I tweaked it a little bit down to 3 or 2, probably isn't going to have a conjugacy to the temp map because the temp map's doing all this funky stuff. And, oh, but maybe there's a slope of the temp map for which it does, like a smaller slope. But we'll talk more about how that all works. Um, so let me, let me write, yeah, Scott? Unique. What do you think? You don't think so? Like there might be another way to do this? Probably. Yeah, there might be another way to do it. If there was, there are probably infinitely many ways to do it. Yeah. Or there could be zero if the dynamics don't match. So we'll, we'll get a better sense as we go along for how... Um, how many ways there are to do this. Um, okay. If the functions, yeah, okay. I don't want to say too much more about it now. Okay, so two ways to get, this is the idea. We have two ways to get from the domain of G to the range of G. They are. Uh, I can evaluate G, so if I want to do it n times, evaluate g of a, gn of x. And in the abstract, this, uh, this could be very expensive. You know, the computer will iterate the logistic map a billion times in a blink of an eye, so it's not expensive. But if you're thinking of g as, you know, some really high dimensional fluid problem, it's incredibly expensive. Cool. Okay, that's one way to do it. The other is to evaluate instead uh, C composed with the nth iterative T composed with C inverse of that same initial condition X. And we get the same answer back for these two operations. So, you know, whenever you do this function composition thing, you start on the right. So the idea again is we're in the domain of G, that's, you know, that's down here, or it's this. Um, y sub n. It's sent through the inverse of the conjugacy, and this transformation takes you into the tent map domain. You evaluate the tent map n times. You get an answer back. That's the, you know, x sub n plus 1. And then you get, you send that thing through the conjugacy, conjugacy and you're back where you started. This isn't a linear transformation here. This is a nonlinear one, because we, we have a tent, and then we have the logistic map, which curves. You got to send it through something funky to get the straight lines to bend. So we're a linear map. We just get a you know like some shifted version of the tent. Okay. Okay, and then the the chain rule, which has been helpful to us several times. Um, the chain rule will also be helpful here. So if I started with the idea that C composed T is equal to G composed C. Um, and then I take the derivative of these functions because I want to know about stability of an orbit. Maybe it's like it's some periodic orbit of, of um, the tent map, and I want to know if it's what it's like in the logistic map. So if I take the derivative of both sides, I'll get that C prime, chain rule of T of x, outside function is C, times T prime, that's the derivative of the inside function, that's going to be equal to, I'm going to do the same thing here on the right, g prime evaluated at c times the derivative of the inside function, c prime of x. Um, so it's not clear yet what happens here on the left. But if I were at a fixed point, imagine I'm at a fixed point x of t, that is t of x equals x, so either at 0 or 2 thirds, for example. And I want to know about the stability of that point, which we know it's a source, but if I wanted to figure it out in here, um, 
Right. So I can plug it in. Uh, and what I'll get back is c prime. So this, if I plug in t of x equals x into this, I just get c prime of x here on the left. Uh, c prime of x times t prime. And that should be equal to, still, I still have g prime of c of x times c prime of x. Um, but I have c prime on both sides, and it's the same thing. So g prime of c of x. So I can cancel these two. This is, as long as this isn't 0, I can do what I'm about to do if this conjugacy slope, which doesn't look like it's 0 on this curve anywhere, as long as this isn't 0, I can divide both sides by it. And what I have is that the slope of the tent map at that point is the same as the slope of the logistic map under its conjugate point. I'm missing a closed paran there. So if I wanted to know the slope at one point, I can figure out that value by looking at the slope of the corresponding point sent through the transformation. So it'll be the same. So if, for example, if that slope, t prime, so this says now t prime, the thing I might be interested in, this, it's 2, right? We know it's 2 um, in magnitude. Well, I would get 2 back if I plugged in 3 quarters into C and then evaluated g prime at that number. I would get uh, minus 2. Yeah? Cool. Sorry, maybe I'll just, I'll just keep going. So there's one more line. Is t, this, I'm just, I've divided both sides by C prime above. Uh, and you're asking why can I just divide by c prime? This isn't a compose. This is a multiplied by. Um, so c prime. This is you know the derivative of this function at a point. And as long as it's not zero, let's say it's uh, one third is the slope when I evaluate c, the slope of c at this point x. It's on both sides. I get a one third here too. So I'm just dividing both sides by that one third. They disappear, and I'm left with just what the slope of t is at that point. And that is the slope of g, but not at that point, at a, uh, you know, whatever the conjugate says that point is. It's corresponding point, sibling in the other uh, domain. Other questions? All right, so this, this little exercise is telling us that the stability, the stability of the point x uh, for t and the point g of x, sorry, not g of x, c of x uh, for g is the same. They're equal. And everything I've said so far is about, you know, this is now just about fixed points. But it'll be true of period two orbits also. So this, if we looked at G2 and T2 and what would happen under them and found the slopes, it would be four would be the slope in magnitude at either one of those points, P1 or P2. And then if I sent those things, those points through the conjugacy and landed on the corresponding points, which are, you know, point three, four, six, and something close to one here. Uh, the slopes here and here, if I took this slope and I took this slope and I multiplied them together, I would get minus 4. I said that already. But the conjugacy would represent um, that relationship nicely. And the same thing would work for period 3 and period 4 and all these higher order things. Um, cool. All right, so that's enough for now about these conjugacies. You'll get to try an example, I think not on this homework, on the next one maybe. Um, but importantly, we're going to talk now about the transition graph symbolic dynamic story with the L's and R's. And we haven't really defined what the arrows in that transition graph mean yet, so that's something we're going to try and do here. This is 3.4. Transition graphs. Transition graphs. So the graph, this is you got nodes, you got arrows between the nodes, edges, 
that's the graph. And the transition, the word transition is referring to the fact that we're going from one place to another. Like we're going from L over to R when we're sent through the function. That's where these words come from. Um, we'll start with a theorem and we'll try and understand it. So, super important for this, everything we're going to do here from now on. Um, let's let F be a continuous map on R. We'll go to higher dimensions once we feel good about this and let there be an interval i going from a to b such that when I look at i as it is sent through the function f it gets stretched across itself. I get a bigger thing back. And I'll draw a picture. Um, if this is true, then f has a fixed point in the interval i. Yeah, so it's kind of, I mean, it's kind of like a less than. This is a, this is a, this is not a less than or equal to sign, but yeah, it's contained within. This is an interval and it is entirely contained within uh, its map where it is sent. So the interval gets stretched. I is being stretched across itself by f. So an example picture of this would be something like so let's see here a Actually, let me make it bigger. So here's an interval i. And uh, i goes from a to b. And then when I look at what happens when it is mapped by this function, the wiggly thing, here's f. When it's mapped by this function, um, it's stretched. So when I look at a to b, namely, and I come over across and look at all the points a and B, where they've been sent, you know, for every point, but for every Y value on this curve between A and B, there's at least one X value that was sent there. And there's other places that they were sent. You know, like, like this point right in here is sent outside of, of A to B, this point right here. And, you know, stuff over here close to B gets mapped to the um, left of A, so tiny stuff. So if I'm thinking about what happened to the interval, well, it's, you know, it's getting all messed around with, but it's stretched. It's being, I is being stretched vertically. And if that's the case, what this theorem is going to tell us is that the black curve crosses y equals x. There won't be a way for this interval i to be stretched across itself by the function without crossing y equals x. So we could try, like I could try and draw a line that you know, satisfied this criteria where I start up here and I say, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make it all the way over to B and have values, you know, this is where I've started with A, I'm going to have values that access all the stuff between A and B vertically. So that means I got to have stuff vertically between here and here. I'm going to try and do it without crossing Y equals X. And I'm doing, I'm doing okay so far, but as soon as I get over close to B, eventually I got to, whoa, I got to come all the way down to A. And when I do, I will have to cross y equals x if the function is continuous. Um, all right. We're going to need to see some more examples of this. Um, so this is called, this is a topological theorem. It's called Brouwer's fixed point theorem. And it actually feels a little bit easier in higher dimensions to understand this. So we'll do a couple examples of that. Uh, OK, so I got my piece of paper here. It's my notes. And, uh, and I'm going to crumple up a piece of paper. Okay, got my crumpled piece of paper. 
I'm putting it down on top of my uncrumpled piece of paper. And there's a map. There's a two-dimensional map that un uncrumples this. So I put, it, I put it down on top. Now there's a two-dimensional map that uncrumples the paper and lays it back down where it started. And the two-dimensional version of this theorem says there's a point on the paper that does not move its x, y, or lat lawn position. I don't know where it is. But there's a spot in there that if I, you know, if I like drilled through the paper, I would find that one of one spot, at least one spot, didn't move. How does that feel? So it, as I uncrumple this, there's a spot that doesn't move. I don't know what it is. That I don't know how that feels. So there's a spot. I don't know where it is. It's right that didn't move. It feels a little better maybe if you think about going to the airport and you're walking around and you're lost and you look at the map. They got the big map standing there. The whole airport has a red dot on it. The red dot, the you are here dot, is the fixed point of the map that takes the airport map and stretches it out onto the airport. And so anytime you're standing at one of those, you know, little kiosks, you're at the fixed point of the mental map that you're then going to try and do that stretches uniformly back on. So that's, that is the fixed point in 2D of this. That's the version of this. Um, so that's kind of neat. There's a, actually a three-dimensional version that, that uh, guarantees there's a spot on the surface of the Earth with no wind always. So it's sort of like you got to take, take like a tennis ball or something where, where there are no seams and try and brush the tennis ball, you know, the little fuzz all in the same direction. And you keep doing it and you keep doing it. And eventually, you know, there's a spot, there's a little cowlick that you can't brush. It's a, that would be a singularity in that little vector field. It's got, you know, it's going to be pointing up out of the plane. Those are the points in three dimensions. The point on the surface of the Earth with no wind, the point on... Uh, that's a fixed point. And the point on the tennis ball that you're trying to comb flat that has a little cowlick sticking out, that's the three-dimensional version of this fixed point theorem. And there are more, but those are sort of a few to nail into your head for now. Questions about that? All right. So we got our fixed point theorem. And this is going to be remarkably helpful for us. Uh, with trying to understand what's going on in these, um, just even just for these simple little maps. So we're going to write down a partition of this interval. That's not going to work. A partition of the interval i. Is a collection. of subintervals which are pairwise disjoint uh, except for the endpoints think think l and r in your head for now so interval i is 0 to 1 l and r is a partition of that interval from 0 to 1, where you know they kind of they overlap at 1 half, but that's the only place they overlap. So they're pairwise disjoint except for the endpoints, um, whose union is i. So in our head, we have you know, the L and the R as a partition of the unit interval from 0 to 1. There are others, like I could have A, B, and C that were from 0 to a third, a third to two thirds, and two thirds to one. I could use that as my partition. It would not make sense to do that for this map, but it will for others. Uh, okay, so this, this works for G, it works for T, and lots of the ones we'll talk about. And this helps us because we're going we're gonna to make these transition graphs that I was talking about. L and R, arrows, connecting them. That's what we're going to do. 
uh, but we need to we need to figure out what these arrows mean, and it has to do with this both of these things. So, all right, to make a transition graph. which describes the dynamics we're abstracting away from actually iterating the map and now thinking just about what happens to L oh it goes over here describing the dynamics under our map um, the dynamics on each of these partitions they won't be arbitrary the partitions will pick uh, we'll pick meaningful ones that reflect what the function does we draw an arrow, this is really important, we draw an arrow from A to B, or L to R, if and only if <coughs> F of A covers B. That is, when I send A through the map F, I get something back that has the set B, the interval B, entirely contained inside of it. So we say, here we'll say F of A covers B. And this, this notation means, um, so if this is B, here's F of A. F of A contains within it B and maybe some other stuff. This isn't, this doesn't presently what I've written say anything about what F does to B, but we're thinking about just what an arrow means. And for example, I could have an A here also. So F of A could cover A, and then I would have an A, F of A, that interval A would have a fixed point under the function F because A gets stretched across it. Uh, some questions. Any questions? All right, let's look at some ones that we know, like the tent map. Here's one, L and R. This is T. And if I try and draw the transition graph for this tent map, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put my partition of the unit interval, I'm going to put those down as nodes in a graph, and then I'm going to draw arrows by reflecting on this definition of what the arrows mean. So let's think first about L and whether it gets an arrow. It can only have two arrows, one to R and one to itself. And we're going to read this through, thinking about L, let's say, first to itself. So we draw an arrow from L to L. If and only if f of L covers L. So I've got my L and I got my f of L. When I stretch L out, when I take 0 to a half and map it through the function, ready? I'll do it. Ready? Does it contain what I've done? Does that f of L contain L inside of it? I see nodding. It does. Because, well, it's got this anchor here at 0. And then a half right over here at the edge, that gets mapped to 1. So yeah, it stretches that interval, it doubles that interval's length, in particular across itself, which means it has to have a fixed point in it, and it does at the origin. Bless you. So that means, so what we've just done is decided that L deserves an arrow to itself, because F of L covers L. Thanks, Rohit. All right, so what about L to R? Should I have an arrow from L to R? Let's read our sentence. We draw an arrow from L to R if and only if F of L covers R. That is, when I take L and I map it under F, I get a set that is bigger than, contains inside of it, and maybe some other stuff, R. Well, looking up here, does when I take L and I map it, do I end up with stuff all the way from a half to one? I do. I do. All the way, so, so in particular, the right half of L, the stuff we call LR, that stuff is mapped by F 
to this interval from 1 half to 1. So L gets an error to R. So what this is saying so far with our arrows is if I'm a random point in L, I could either stay in L after one iterate or I could go to R. Those are my two options. And if I stay in there another iterate, if I think, well, what about three iterates down the road? Well, I could stay in L or I could go to R. All of those things are possible. I could stay in L 73 times and then go to R on the 74th iterate. That's also possible. There's a point that does exactly that. In fact, an interval, a small interval that does it of size 2 to the minus 74. That little interval does L 73 times and then goes to R. OK, let's think about R now. According to the thing, does, should R get an arrow to itself? Uh, an arrow from R to R, if and only if f of R covers R. So let's think about f of R. Well, f of R is also the whole interval from 0 to 1. It's stretched. R is stretched across the whole interval. So of course, it stretches across a half to 1. So it gets this arrow. That means, by the way, there should be a fixed point in R because of the theorem. If a function stretches across an interval across itself, there should be a fixed point. Bang, there it is, R, R bar. Two thirds. All right, and it also gets an arrow back to L because f of r covers L. This little bit, the stuff from three quarters to one, is mapped to stuff between zero and a half by the function. Transition graph is full. Any sequence of L's and R's you could possibly want, you can write those down. So you think about question one how do I prove on your homework? This would be a way to prove it, that the logistic map has chaotic orbits. For example, I could pick an orbit of the tent map that has L's and R's that never repeat. And then with this conjugacy we just talked about, map from the tent map point to the logistic map point, and that point ought to be chaotic also. They share stability. OK. They aren't always like this, though, right? There was a I should say at least, the logistic map has the same transition graph. Okay, what about the logistic map where t we did 2x1 minus x? We did draw the transition graph for this thing earlier. We didn't know what it meant, but we drew it. We had the L and the R. Nothing maps to R. This is a half here. Nothing maps above a half, which means I miss. there's a bunch of arrows that are gone now. So L goes to itself, that represents the existence of this fixed point and the fact that L, that interval gets stretched from 0 to a half, cool. It doesn't get stretched, it's just, it gets sent there. And then uh, R is sent to L. Everything between a half and 1 gets mapped to L, and that's it. Those are the arrows. Chaos can't happen here because everything starts to look like R L bar. So I'm not going to end up with a sequence of L's and R's that never repeats for this guy because that's not an accessible path through this transition graph. Cool? Questions? Yeah, Duncan? So does one half count as both L and R? Annoyingly, we have to stitch them together somewhere. So we do it, in this case, at a half for lots of reasons. But you know, a half is the point whose EP to 0, the source at 0, and therefore tells us about the boundaries between these subpartitions, LL, LR, and then the next one. And the, you know, those boundary points are all going to be EP to a half. Um, and it's a, it's a part of both. Yeah, that's OK, though. So is it enough? to talk about just transition graphs when you're talking about conjugates also, like if two, if two graphs have the same, I mean if two maps have the same transition graph then they're conjugates of each other, or is it not enough? That's a great question, yeah. So the, the existence of two maps that have the same transition graph does not imply a conjugacy exists. But the, if a conjugacy exists, the transition graphs will be the same, yeah. Other questions? So we're going to look at some more sophisticated um, maps than these two before we're done. But just want to write one more thing down here. Uh, OK. So there's continuity here. So continuous functions, like the ones we're iterating, 
they preserve continuity, which, um, which means that if A is a subset of B, then when I take those sets and run them through a function, I'll have that F of A is a subset of F of B. Um, and that means that if I have a transition graph that allows me to go from you know, one partition element to another to another, A to B to C, so if this is allowed, Um, then, okay, then it's the case that, just writing down what our arrows mean, f of a covers b, and f of b covers c. Um, and the second iterative f, looking at a, cover C. So we're going to be looking at higher iterates of this too. Generally speaking, if S1, S2, dot, 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 SK plus 1 is an allowable path, then if I take the kth iterate of f starting at s1, that thing will cover sk plus 1. This is, this is just reflecting the fact that this stretching thing that I'm doing, because the function is continuous, it will keep happening um, as I raise it to higher and higher periods. So in particular, the consequence of this is if this this last symbol, the sk plus 1, is something that I've seen before, a sequence that I've seen before. Um, all right, so if, for example, s1, s2, dot, 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 sk, s1 is a path in the transition graph, that would be in my L's and R's, like, L is the first one, L is the second, L is the third, R is the fourth, and then back to L for the fifth. So it's a symbol that I've seen before. S1 is um, showing up later in the sequence, which obviously that can happen in this case. Um, then FK of S1 covers S1. So I got a sequence of these L's and R's, or lots of different letters, A's and B's and C's, and what have you. It's this transition, this, all this uh, the partition of an interval I care about. If it's an allowable path in the transition graph that I'm, I can write it down, that means that the kth iterate of S1, really, if I've done k of these, you know, I've stretched a lot of times, that covers this interval. Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to write it down. That's just the definition of these arrows. And in particular, if this is a symbol that I've seen before, like it's L, R, and then L again. So I've seen L. It was, it was, um, so if I can write down L, R, L, so this is S1, this is S2, and now I've come back to S1 again. This means that F3, or F2, sorry, F2 of S1, so F2, uh, S1 is L, covers L. That's an application of this. Um, all right, and that's good because what this means is um, the second iterate of f, if I start at l, covers l. So that means f2 has a fixed point in l. Yes, it could be l bar, but it also could be a period 2 orbit, a point that if I, s the fixed point doesn't have to be necessarily that one. So it could be a period 2 orbit. So the ability to put a sequence of letters down and then see a letter you've seen before means there's a fixed point of length how many letters you have prior to that thing appearing. A fixed point of that, you know, of Fn, or Fk in this case. Um, so we'll need to see an example of this.
Okay. Fk is a sub. Yeah. Okay. So this implies Fk has a fixed point. Um, uh, Fk has a fixed point in the subinterval that is x s1 s2 dot 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 Sk. And that is a subinterval. It's a bunch of letters. So that's like one of these, you know, little pieces of the interval that I'm carving up. So let's do an example that isn't the logistic or tent map. This will be helpful, I think. So this is uh, 3.19 in your, your oh, it's ex figure 3.9 in your book. Yeah. I don't know what the functional form of this thing is, and I, we don't need it. We have a, a interval. Let's call it 0 to 1. Let's say this is 0 and this is 1, and it maps onto itself 0 to 1. And we'll just talk about what we can see from the letters. We have a partition i, j, k. Those, that's the L and the R. But now we have 3 instead of 2. And we're wondering what happens to points under this map. We're not going to iterate a function. We're just going to wave our hands, and by the time we're done, we'll know what every point does on the board. Because of this symbolic dynamic story, because of the transition graph, we'll understand why it looks like that. Cool. So do you see a fixed point if this is 0 to 1 and 0 to 1? Yeah? Where does it look like the fixed point is? It looks like it's around a half. Yeah. So let's say that this thing, um, I don't know what the functional form of it is, but I don't need to. Let's just say that, so this is a, uh, figure 3.9 we're talking about. Um, cool. Figure 3.9. Fixed point. Go back to purple. We got a fixed point at, let's say it's x equals a half. And the existence of that fixed point is implied by one of the particular arrows on the board in the transition graph. Which arrow implies a fixed point? Yeah, the one back to itself. So j, f of j covers j. That's what this arrow means. So if I take j and I say, well, what happens to it? Does it get stretched across itself? So here's j right here vertically. And when I take j and I send it through the function, in fact, it gets stretched all the way from 0 to 1 and in flipped all the way from 0 to 1. So it's going to have an arrow. j is going to have an arrow to all three. It's going to have an arrow to i, it's going to have an arrow to j, because f of j covers all three of these things. Cool. Including itself. So the arrow from j to itself means that I can have a point that starts in j and stays in j. Forever. I can have the, the sequence j, 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 poop, j bar. So this thing, we'll, we'll give this the name j bar. Does it look like a sink, that fixed point? The transition graph doesn't really tell us that whether that point's a sink or a source, but the picture looks like the slope is super negative there. So if I start nearby, I'm going to cobweb out. Does it look like I'm going to stay in J for very long? No, the slope is really big here. So that's very unstable. And I'll wander, you know, the y equals x line isn't on here, but I'm going to wander away right out of there. So I'm, going to, I'm leaving. J is sending points out. So that's a, this is a source, fixed point source. So points don't go to that thing. Maybe there are other sort. Uh, maybe there are sinks. Yeah. I don't know. What do you think? Like we have, we haven't really seen examples of transition graphs with lots of sinks yet, except for the two x one minus x. 
2x1 minus x has a sink where like the arrows go into L and then they don't leave. Yeah? So the idea of having arrows, arrows leaving, that means there's stretching happening. Well, sorry, the arrow to itself means there's stretching happening in that interval. So, yeah, we'll think about, think about that. I'm not ready to say yet, but good. It's a good question. Other questions about what we're seeing so far? I'm, I'm wondering where the points go. Like where, yeah? I was wondering, you know, the names go J um, towards the end of Israel when the group of this game was in less than um, one. Yeah. Would that, does that mean that, like... You mean, like, down like, here? Yeah. Like, does that mean that it's going to be, like, a sink somehow? Well, so this is not a crossing of y equals x. So it's not a fixed point of the function. However, it could be a period two. So what happens to, let's say this point's two-thirds. Where does two-thirds get sent by the function? Zero. Where does zero get sent by the function? Two-thirds. That sounds like a period two orbit. Let's write that down. Period two at uh, zero comma two-thirds. Is there a set of letters that you think could reflect the existence of that period two orbit? I'll give you a hint. It's length two, the set of letters. What's the itinerary of that orbit? In terms of ij's and k's. I, k? Feels like, so if it's zero, zero is definitely an i, right? And then that gets sent to two thirds which I kind of want to call K because it doesn't feel fair to call it J. So we'll call it I K. And it goes forever. I K. Because if it's in I at zero, it's not going to go somewhere else. It just goes back and forth. Yeah? Is that a source or a sink? You said something about the slopes. Yeah. What would I want to be true of the slopes at zero and two thirds, if it were going to be a sink, I hear a lot of mumbling. Great. So I need to be able to take the slope here and the slope there, multiply them together because I'm not composing f with itself and finding the slopes at the two places that f two would cross y equals x at zero and two thirds. But if I did, I think I'd find slopes smaller than 1 in magnitude because this number multiplied by that number is going to be smaller than 1. So this is a sink. I'm telling you, you're going to have to believe me. That slope is really small. It's not 0 at that point, but it's small. The 0 slope happens to the right of 2 thirds. This is a sink, which means that if I start nearby, like, for example, just a little bit bigger than 0, I'm going to do this with my cursor. If I start a little bit bigger than 0 and I go all the way over to y equals x and I come down to the function, I land somewhere in k that's closer, well actually I'm, I've landed in i, but I've landed closer to 0 than I was before because of how flat the slope is. This is asymmetric by the way. I don't know if you can tell that, but this, this curvature here is not a flip of this curvature. This is a lot flatter. It's, this is symmetric with this up here. So, alright, let me do that again. I start near 0, I evaluate it, I get, I get pushed into k, and I'm, I'm not, not as close to two, I'm past 2 thirds, go over to y equals x, down to my function, and when I land here, I am very close to 0 on the function. So when I come back over, I'm even closer than I was the previous time. So points are going to spiral into that period 2 sink if they start nearby. Cool. We have two orbits like this. J bar and I k bar, my transition graph. Are there other trans allowable Sequences that I could write down, I mean, there's lots of ways to write down letters, i, j, and k. Can, you, can somebody give me another way to write down letters that would work? Can I do this? Can I do j, 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 k, i, k, i, k, i? Does that work? Okay. What did that point do? To stay on J for a while? 
well, what if I started really, really close to that source and my cobweb said, do, 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 and it spent some time spiraling away? Yeah? So I could stay in J 73 times if I started really close. And then once I'm out, I'm not coming back in. So I come into I and K. Which, where do I go in IK? What do you think? I mean, if I, once I'm in IK, can I get back to J? No, I'm stuck. You think you go right to the sink. OK, well, let's think about that. Is that, is that the only period, periodic orbit? Can you see? This thing? Yeah. Where, does, where does 1 get sent? Over to y equals x down to a third. And a third gets sent to 1. And 1 gets sent to a third. There is another period 2 orbit, 1 third going to 1. Well, confusingly, it appears that I also have to call that IK bar, doesn't it? Because I don't want to call, J, J is its own unique thing, it's sending points out. It's going to be OK, by the way. You're worried about like how are we going to write down letter, when there's ambiguity, which letter we choose. It's going to be OK. Um, that would not solve this problem that we're having. Uh, incidentally, so one of these points, like that point will have the itinerary IK bar. That point will have the itinerary KI bar. And same thing for these, these two. This, does this look like a sink? Let's look at it. So let's say I started near a third, like right here, but a little less than a third. I evaluate to almost one, like super close to one. And when I come over and then I come down, I'm actually pushed a little further away from a third than I was before. But when I come over and then I come up, I am really, really close to one. So this curvature right here, being a lot flatter near the top, tiny, tiny slope compared with this, is going to pull me in. This is a sink also. All right, I got two period two sinks sitting. These are squares that are sitting uh, at the edges of my partition. I've got a source at the point one half that sends things away. We talked about the existence of this orbit where I have 73 j's followed by either ki bar or ik bar, because that's the only thing that I can do. Can't go back to J, and I can't stay. I can't stay in itself, and J, and K can't stay in itself. Their arrows aren't going to each other because they don't map across themselves. Okay, so that point that I just described, which of these two sinks does it go to? Seventy-three J's, and then I K bar. Which direction you were going to Totally, yeah. So if you were above the fixed point, you'd go to the top square sink, but if you were below it, you'd go to the bottom square sink. You're saying that like if your initial condition was just above the sink, yeah. you think you're gonna head to one of the two or just above the source, you're gonna head to one of the two sinks. And if it's just below, you'll go to the other. But what if I picked a point that was sent to this point but started below? Because that point exists, right? The one that goes root, root. Yeah. It's a good, it's a good thought. Great answer. You can pretty much write that down for any question I ask you this year. Oh. So yeah, it depends. And quite sensitively, because if these are both sinks, we haven't decided what the basin of the two sinks. You've got period, two period two orbits. They have to have basins of things that are attracted to them that consist of uh, pretty much everything between 0 and 1, because the you know, stuff in J, except for that point, are going to go to those two sinks. Have we said anything about sinks and the existence of, like, there has to be a boundary between basins of sinks, right? What's that going to be? A source, yes, but there's no other fixed point source. E P to J bar. E P to J bar. 
Does anything map to J-bar? Nothing maps to J-bar, but it's, so it can't be those. Good, good thought, good thought, though. You can't see it in the picture, maybe, but there's another square. There's another period two orbit that sits between the two that we just found that is a source. It's a period two source. Its itinerary is also IK bar, frustratingly. And it divides the basins of these two sinks, period two sinks, and they are, you know, deciding whether a point close to J goes to which or the other. You'd have to know which side of the period two square you're sent to, that the period two square lives, you know, it's somewhere in between. It's sort of like here, and it goes over to y equals x and lands here, and if you miss by a little bit, you're going to one of the two sinks. Okay, homework five's up. That's enough for today. Have a great weekend, everybody.